For nearly three centuries, between the 1500s and 1800s, the Barbary pirates ran amok throughout the Mediterranean and the Atlantic. They were a perpetual thorn in the sides of both Europeans and Americans sailing these waters. They attacked ships along trade routes and pillaged coastal towns until many inhabitants from Spain to Italy gave up and abandoned their villages. The pirates enriched themselves along the way. They took gold, jewels, and spices. But probably the most valuable commodities they stole and traded were humans. Welcome back to Nutty History. Today, we're exploring the dark story of history's forgotten prisoner trafficking network, the Barbary Trade. Chained below decks of the Barbary Corsair ships, prisoners were forced to row until they couldn't row anymore. The Barbary pirates sailed galleys that relied more on oar power than wind power. As the pirates tore across the Mediterranean, many of their male prisoners were sold into hard labor in North Africa and the women became part of the harems of wealthy men. But the most brutal fate for those taken by the pirates were oarsmen on their galleys. They were chained to their oars. They had to relieve themselves where they sat, and they were fed meager rations of rotting vegetables and fish. Exhaustion, disease, and infections from sores caused by rowing nonstop led to massive loss of life and very short lives for those unlucky enough to be doomed to life below decks, if life is what you could call it. Estimates for the number of prisoners taken by the Barbary pirates remain cloudy. The historian Robert Davis has estimated that Barbary traders from Tuni, Algiers, and Tripoli took over 1 million Europeans as captives in the 250 years between the start of the 16th century and the middle of the 18th century. Who were these pirates? And how did they help set up one of the most extensive prisoner trafficking networks that no one has heard of? At face value, the term Barbary Corsairs might seem to refer to barbers who cut unruly hair. Though many of the Barbary pirates for sure had some wild salty locks, this is unfortunately not the origin of the name. Corsair, first of all, is just another word for pirate, and Barbary is the anglicized version of Berber. Berbers were an indigenous ethnic throughout North Africa, mostly in Morocco, Algeria, Tunisia, Libya. Regions where most of the Barbary pirates, though not all, as we'll soon find out, came from. Although peak Barbary piracy spanned the three centuries between the 1500s and 1800s, their history on the Mediterranean goes back a lot further. And at the end of the 12th century, Barbary pirates were such a nuisance that a French Catholic organization called the Trinitarians was founded in order to collect ransoms for the people who were captured and forced into hard labor around North Africa. In 1390, the French and the Genoese teamed up to attack the Berber stronghold of Madia in what's now Tunisia. The resulting Barbary Crusade was yet another Christian versus Muslim standoff, although the reasons for the attack were as much economic as they were religious. The Franco-Genoese siege of Madia ended in a draw, with both sides declaring victory. The Berbers successfully beat back the Europeans, but the Genoese and French were able to gain a bit more access to and enjoy less Barbary interference along certain maritime trade routes. But the Barbary pirate era really got into full swing towards the end of the 15th century and the beginning of the 16th. Two fairly drawn-out historical developments during this time helped turn the Barbary pirates from small-town nuisances to full-blown Mediterranean menaces. But before we find out about them, we need to tell you that this video was brought to you by World of Tanks. World of Tanks is a free-to-play action PC game with over 100 million players worldwide. Destroyers, artillery, light tanks, heavy tanks, medium tanks. There are over 600 tanks to choose from, making it possible for everybody to find their playstyle. Hop in your tanks to drive through deserts and forests, climb steep hills, and sneak through urban and industrial environments to achieve your goal. There are over 40 arenas to play, and you can upgrade and modify your tank in a metal beast that can face any challenge. We at Nutty History love this game for its historical accuracy and how the game makes us feel like being inside a real tank. Download the game using the link in the description below and use the code TANKMANIA to get benefits of having a premium account for the first seven days, 250,000 credits, premium tank Excelsior, and three rental tanks for 10 battles each. Check out World of Tanks merch on Amazon. The store link is in the description. The first was something called the Reconquista. Since the 700s, the Iberian Peninsula, now modern-day Spain and Portugal, 
had been mostly controlled by the Umayyad Caliphate, a Muslim dynasty that at one point stretched nearly into India in the east, through the Arabian Peninsula, across northern Africa, and into Iberia in the west. Over the next 700 years, Christian kingdoms fought the Muslims in a drawn-out series of wars that was dubbed the Reconquista, or Reconquest. By 1139, the Kingdom of Portugal was founded, and 100 years later, Portugal's Reconquista was officially finished. Spain had more work to do, though, and during the mid-1400s, Ferdinand and Isabella joined the houses of Castile and Aragon and cracked down hard on any non-Catholics. As a result, thousands of people fled to North Africa, mostly Muslims and Jews, many of whom turned to piracy. Two of the most famous Barbary pirates were Sephardic Jews whose families had been forced from their homes in Iberia. Both held Spain and Portugal in high contempt, for obvious reasons, and went about doing all they could to get their revenge. The first, Senan Reis, probably became the most famous Jewish pirate in history. He carried out countless raids of Spanish and Portuguese ships in the Mediterranean, amounting to millions of dollars worth of valuables, and even helped build a fleet to help India expel the Portuguese from their territory. Because of pirates like him, both Spain and Portugal lost hundreds of ships over the centuries. The other, Samuel Palache, was a Moroccan-born Jew whose family had been forced to flee Iberia. Palache actually became quite a successful diplomat, and he was instrumental in finalizing a trade agreement between the Netherlands and Morocco in 1610, one of the first treaties between a European country and a non-Christian country. The second historical development that led to the rise of the Barbary pirates was the Ottoman conquest of North Africa. By 1566, the Ottoman Empire controlled nearly all of the region. However, the Ottomans pretty much left the regional governments alone and let them do what they wanted as long as their kings paid tribute to the Sultan in Istanbul and gave them military help when they needed it. But many powerful Ottoman captains did end up making their way to North Africa and turning to piracy, state-sponsored or otherwise. One of the most famous was Hayreddin Barbarossa. He and his brother Oric started off as corsairs, raiding Spanish and Italian ships in the Mediterranean. They amassed a pretty sizable fleet and then went about raiding Spanish coastal towns and cities. In 1516, the brothers captured Algiers from the Spanish, and they were de facto rulers of the city for a couple of years before it was annexed by the Ottomans. Eventually, Barbarossa rose from an Ottoman corsair to the highest naval rank in the empire, becoming the Admiral General of the Ottoman Navy, amassing a fleet of 210 ships. The Barbary Corsairs were not content with just plundering the Mediterranean, and by the early 17th century, they had begun moving up into the British Isles and Scandinavia. From 1609 to 1616 alone, the English lost 466 ships to Barbary piracy. The Barbary trade and the raids that fed it became so problematic that the English government set up an organization called the Committee for Algiers in 1640 that was tasked with overseeing the ransoming of captives. According to reports at the time, there were somewhere between 3,000 and 5,000 English people being held in captivity in Algiers. In 1646, a guy named Edmund Carson was sent to Algiers by the English to try and get back as many prisoners as he could. At around 30 pounds per man, and even more for women, Carson managed to buy back about 250 English men and women before he ran out of money. Eventually, the pirate threat around the British Isles became so bad that it even affected the fishing industry, as no fishermen wanted to head out to sea for fear of being attacked by the Barbary Corsairs. The Corsairs even became a threat in Denmark. At the beginning of the 18th century, a fund was set up called the Slavikase. Money was systematically collected from churches around the country to help pay for the ransom of hundreds of Danish and Norwegian sailors captured by the pirates. By the mid-1600s, Europeans began negotiating with the pirates. Treaties were set up, usually involving tributes to the pirates in the form of money in exchange for the promise that the pirates wouldn't attack any Sinai ships. After the American Revolution, the protection against Barbary piracy that was afforded under British rule vanished, and the newly formed United States had to figure out how to handle the pirate threat as their ships brought valuable goods across the Atlantic from the Mediterranean. It started with Morocco. Morocco has a unique and often overlooked place in American history. 
It was both the first country to recognize the United States as an independent nation in 1777 and the first country to take an American ship after the U.S. achieved independence. Despite that, the Americans and Moroccans finally agreed to a truce. The 1786 Moroccan-American Treaty of Friendship still stands as the United States' oldest non-broken treaty with a foreign power. But there were still threats from Barbary Corsairs sailing out of Algiers, Tuni, and Tripoli. Between 1785 and 1790, pirates from Algiers captured more than a dozen American ships and hundreds of prisoners. Finally, in 1796, Algiers and the U.S. agreed on a treaty where the U.S. would pay more than half a million dollars in exchange for the return of the captives and shipping protections. A similar deal was struck with the rulers of Tripoli and Tuni. But in 1801, the ruler of Tripoli canceled its treaty and declared war on American shipping in the region. In response, the U.S. teamed up with Sweden to lay siege to important harbors in Tuni, Tripoli, and Algiers. It became known as the First Barbary War. After four years of blockades, sieges, and battles, the three Barbary states eventually succumbed and signed a treaty ending the war. It was an uneasy truce, though. And when the Americans turned their attention back towards North America during the War of 1812, the Barbary pirates went right back to pillaging American ships in the Mediterranean. This led to the Second Barbary War in 1815. This one was shorter and resulted in a resounding American victory that all but ended the rampant piracy that had been going on for centuries. No longer would the U.S. and other European countries pay tribute to pirates in exchange for protections. The whole episode was one of the primary reasons for the rapid development of the United States Navy, a navy that will go on to dominate the world in the next couple of hundred years. What part of history do you think is often overlooked or has been forgotten about? Let us know in the comments, and don't forget to like and subscribe for more Nutty History.